Noon is a program here, we have a programming break. Um, we have two talks this afternoon. The first will be um, by David Pitt from Cal State Los Angeles, who is visiting the project as our project visitor for these two months of May and June. He's come all the way from sunny Los Angeles to sunny Cambridge. <laughs> and we're very grateful to have him here. Uh, and he's going to be talking about acquaintance and phenomenal concepts. So, thank you. Thank you, Tim, also for inviting me to sunny Cambridge. I kept imagining a sunny when I was thinking about it in LA, and I kept it saying, correcting myself and saying, no, it's going to be cloudy and rainy all the time. But no. Okay, so I'm going to briefly make. Um, bunch of inflammatory remarks, and then uh, go to the discussion. I'm not sure how long it'll take. And I thought it was a workshop, but that's the big one. Okay. So I want to talk about concepts first, and I don't think this is terribly inflammatory yet, but concepts, I don't think, are percepts. So we can have concepts of things that we can't perceive, like transfine and ordinals. And I don't think they're the same as images because we can have concepts of things we can have images of, like myriagons, million-sided figures. Um, and I think this is also an intuitive thing, that conceptual contents are thinkable. They're things we think with, so their contents have to be things that can be thought. Percepts are not thinkable. Images are not thinkable, nor are external objects thinkable. Um, so, um, but concept, conceptual contents are, so none of these things can be conceptual contents. That's kind of an intuitive argument, <clears throat> but I'm going to, I have also more tend tendentious reasons for thinking this is true, here's where the inflammatory part starts. Um, I think thinking is a kind of experience, it involves cognitive or conceptual or propositional phenomenology, which is a sui generis kind of experience, which is as different from the familiar auditory, olfactory, visual, et cetera, kinds, as each of them is from the others. So it's a, what I, I called um, my 2004 paper, a proprietary phenomenology that belongs to thinking and, and, and uh, nothing else. So, <clears throat> Then to be thinkable is to be cognitive and analogical, just as to be hear hearable is to be auditory phenomenological, to be smellable is to be olfactory phenomenological. So here's another reason to think that uh, conceptual contents can't be any of these other things, because they're not cognitive phenomenological. So you can't hear smells, you can't taste sounds, you can't smell sights, visual experiences, and none of these can be thought. It doesn't make any sense to talk about thinking smells. You can think of them, I think that's what, yes. You can think about these things, but you can't think them. So I think that's a reason to think that they are not conceptual contents. And I think also, therefore, conceptual contents can be individuated by non-cognitive phenomenology. Um, and therefore, that there can be no phenomenal concepts in the special sense in which people have used uh, such things to respond to Jackson's memory of the black and white room argument. There, of course, can be concepts like pain and, and smell and sound, which are concepts of phenomenal experience. Um, but they're not individuated by the experiences they're about, either because they in some way contain them or because they are indexical concepts, and indexical concepts are individuated by their reference. And here goes a really inflammatory thing. I don't believe that indexical concepts are individuated by their reference. Okay, so there can only be concepts whose reference are non-cognitive phenomenal states. So there are no concepts whose contents are or individuated by percepts, images, external objects, etc. And concepts, so one conception which I uh, find in, in 
uh, former incarnation of, or former time slice of David Papineau and Kavi Balog, where a, a phenomenal concept is something like, you know, sort of a conceptual claw. It, it reaches in and grabs a bit of phenomenology or quotes it, or creates various other metaphors. So on these views, the idea is that the that the sample of the relevant phenomenology is a constituent of the concept. Now, <clears throat> I think this is impossible for the intuitive reason that you can think concepts, but you can't think those things. But my more uh, <clears throat> proprietary reason for thinking this is impossible is that a con I think a concept is a bit of experience, and it's a bit of experience of the cognitive kind, and you can't have non-cognitive phenomenology or not a cognitive sample <clears throat> as a part of that, any more than you can have a sound that's part of a smell, <laughs> or a smell that's part of a, of a taste. Well, that's more complicated, but a smell is part of a visual experience. Um, <clears throat> so <coughs> you might have a total state that has a conceptual component and, and say, a, a visual component, but you can have a concept, part of which is a visual experience. So this is um, <clears throat> Uh, an intuition I am calling these days phenomenal immiscibility. These they can't mix. Um, you can have some state that has parts that are so like your state, your total uh, experiential state right now has auditory components, visual components, etc. But you can't have um, <coughs> a smell, part of which is a sound or an itch, part of which is a feeling of remorse. Um, and this is reminiscent of, of Frege's view that propositions can only, thoughts, we call thoughts, can only be composed of senses. And he was, I don't know if he was, but I like to pretend he was shocked at Russell's idea that a thought could contain an alp. But, well, no. Alps aren't the kinds of things that can be thought. Senses can be thought. Um, and thoughts are composed of senses, and, the, and, and Mont Blanc isn't a sense. So this is something in that spirit. So this sort of conceptual claw view, or quotation view, I think uh, doesn't make sense. So, <clears throat> what I think then about Mary is, is that she acquires no new concepts when she leaves the grayscale, because it's not just black and white, white right? the grayscale. <laughs> And that there are no new thoughts that she can think when she leaves. In the room, she can think, this is puce of a gray patch. And it's the very same thought that she would be thinking truly of a puce patch outside of the room. And in the background here is, is my view that um, Demonstrative concepts are individuated by their reference. And so I know that there are powerful intuitions that, that Kaplan appeals to, um, um, supporting the view that there's refer referential individuation of contents. So he would say, for example, if, if I uh, have the thought that I would express by saying, I'm hungry, and you have the thought that you would express by saying, I'm hungry. We're thinking different thoughts. Why? Well, because they can have different truth values. I think that doesn't follow. And I also think that it's equally intuitive to say, no, we're thinking exactly the same thoughts. I mean, I'm thinking about me, and you're thinking about you. I can't think it about you. That's part of how the concept I works. And you can't think it about me. But it's the same thought. So. Uh, a metaphor I like is, look, if I take my hat off and put it on your head, it's the same hat. It doesn't change its identity um, uh, in virtue of who said it's on. So the I concept doesn't change its concept, uh, content, rather, depending on um, who it refers to. And so Kaplan, of course, introduces this character content distinction, but I think that distinction is ultimately unmotivated, and I want to say that what he's calling character of an indexical is its content. And that has 
he's pointed out some counterintuitive consequences, but I'm willing to swallow those. So that's what's in the background here. So this is puce photo gray patch, and this is puce photo puce patch are the same thought. They have the same content, but they're thought of different things. So when Mary leaves the room, she can think this is puce truly about a puce patch that she sees. There's one now, in case you didn't know what puce looks like. Apparently there are many shades of puce. Um, puce is also the French word for flea, so if you Google it, you'll get a lot of fleas as well. Which is what happened to me. Um, now, I want to say that this is knowledge by acquaintance. And the idea is that um, the, she is acquainted with the puce patch, and she has, a, she has conceptual or propositional knowledge about it that's based on the experience. So this is a thought she could not think truly in a great scale room. Now she can think, think it truly, and she's justified on the basis of the way the patch looks. Um, so, maybe I say this again a little bit later, but I want to say it now. So there's one sense in which Mary gains new knowledge, uh, new propositional knowledge when she leaves the room. Because a thought that she could not think truly in the room is a thought that she can think truly when she's out of the room. So what was a false belief becomes a true belief and is justified, and let's not worry about what knowledge is, but close enough. Um, but I don't think that's the, the sense in which uh, anybody is, is press, pressing uh, the idea that Mary gains new knowledge. I think the idea is that Mary, for some people anyway, that Mary can think things she couldn't think before, and that's the basis for having new knowledge, but I don't think that's the case. Now, suppose she's released by Martina Nino Rublin's Mariana only into what I like to call a technicolor vestibule, where there's lots of colors, but nothing recognizable. So uh, Mariana can't say that's red, that's blue, because there are no recognizable objects that she has learned to have these various colors. But she, she sees the colors. Um, so can she still come to know what puce looks like in the technicolor vestibule? And I say, yeah, she can. She can come to know what puce looks like without knowing it's puce that looks like that. So she can't think truly and justifiably of any patch that it's puce. She might accidentally look at puce patch and say, that's puce. Um, <clears throat> uh, but that's an accident, so it doesn't count as knowledge. But I, I do think there's a sense in which she can know what puce looks like if she's looking at it, if she's experiencing it. Without applying concept puce, and even without thinking at all. So what I want to suggest um, is that she can know what puce looks like without knowing that she knows what puce looks like. And that acquaintance per se, and by acquaintance, I'll say this again later, I just mean experience, conscious experience, per se is a form of knowledge. Knowing what it's like um, is what I call acquaintance knowledge. It's not propositional. So we've knowledge by description, knowledge by acquaintance, and what I'm calling acquaintance knowledge, what Earl Coney calls phenomenal knowledge in a, a really interesting paper from 1994. He didn't um, continue to develop, to develop his ideas at all, unfortunately, so I'll do it. Uh, one and two are conceptual, they involve the application of concepts. Uh, three, I, I want to insist, is non-conceptual. So being acquainted with Pews, experiencing Pews, is knowing what it's like to see views. And no concepts need to be applied. So knowing that this is puce in the presence of a puce patch is knowledge by acquaintance. Knowledge is justified by acquaintance. But the acquaintance itself, I'm saying, uh, is not knowledge, that conceptual knowledge about an instance of puce. It is knowing what it's like. So, um, that this is puce is knowledge about an instance of puce, where puce, this refers to the instance of puce. So, and I think this, this kind of knowledge can be retained as long as you can um, either imagine, imaginatively, voluntarily call up an image of puce, or an image of puce can run through your mind, 
um, it need to be something you can do at will. But if knowing what, what puce looks like is simply experiencing it, and you can know that without knowing it's puce that you're experiencing, without conceptually um, identifying it, then so long as um, you're capable of puce experiences, you continue to know what puce looks like. You can forget what puce looks like if you can't imagine to be experience it anymore. Okay, and an experience is what I was saying before, an experience of puce can be recalled even if it can't be identified as such. So acquaintance knowledge and knowledge by, by acquaintance have different persistence conditions. You can lose, uh, you can not have knowledge by acquaintance, but still have acquaintance knowledge. And you can lose knowledge by acquaintance, but still have acquaintance knowledge. Um, acquaintance knowledge just is experience, and knowledge by acquaintance is knowledge that about that experience. So I, I want to suggest that acquaintance knowing is the basic mode of knowing for phenomenal properties. Knowledge by acquaintance depends on it. You can't have knowledge by acquaintance without acquaintance. Um, but um, knowing what it's like is simply a matter of having the experience of the thing. And it's a, um, it's a kind of knowledge that's not conceptual knowledge. Now, I've got a blank screen here because I didn't know if I wanted to say this. Um, I could stop there, actually. <coughs> I've said enough to make people angry. No, just puzzle. Puzzle, okay, good. Then I'll stop there so you can, so I can unpuzzle you. Who feels about how? I want to say that.